Welcome everybody to Bugbears and Brews. My name is Brian and today we're doing encounter recap number 22 of the Storm King Thunder campaign. Uh, so starting off we do have a new permanent player, uh, Anthony, who's joined us a couple times uh, playing Rondi the Rogue. He's going to be joining us on a permanent situation and uh, so that's good. You know we always liked whenever he joined and his table sadly we had to nix it. Um, or no, he, he had one table that got nixed uh, because of unreliable DM. Then the other table he moved to, that DM ended up having some personal issues come up and couldn't continue uh, DMing for the foreseeable future. So uh, we brought him into the fold. And starting off in the camp or the session, uh, start off with you guys in Elm Chase. And you guys were trying to uh, essentially franchise it. You were trying to get the uh, Shundak who took over as councilman. You're trying to get him to buy into your guys' brand. Uh, and he wasn't really buying it. And he was actually trying to sell you guys the town as, a, as opposed to him buying into your guys' uh, franchise uh, you know, opportunity there. In the end, discussions didn't seem to go so well. There was threats of violence by uh, you guys. Uh, unspoken threats of violence, let's say that. Um, and Shundak was acting very weird, you know, very full of himself, uh, you know, humming a hill to the chief and putting up new pictures all over the place and wearing a, a makeshift crown. And so when you guys left, you felt that uh, Shundak uh, probably isn't the best person to have in lead of Elm Chase here. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that if you guys ever decide to come, go back. Uh, but before you did actually leave Elm Chase, you went ahead and gathered up uh, whatever goods you needed for a desert expedition. So you picked up a, a bunch of water, uh, some desert gear, a uh, little ski type things to switch out your wheels for, for the wagon. So the wagon was more of a sled versus, uh, uh, you know, wheels. And then you guys headed off towards the desert. Uh, so your idea was to go north until you hit the desert and then kind of stay along the outskirts looking at the map that you had and try to skirt around the west side of the, uh, or go west and skirt around the outside of the desert and get past and went into the wastelands that way you guys can get to the encampment of the Shadar Kai people. Uh, that was working well for a point, but as you guys went further and further west, uh, the object you were relying on to tell you guys, you know, your distance and heading and all that was a large mountain range. And as you guys were getting, you know, a day or two progressed, the mountain range only like, peak that much more over the horizon so either you guys are progressing as far as you thought or the distance in between uh, the two points was far larger than you expected so uh, after some discussion you decided you know what let's go ahead and take a turn north um, before you did that though you did decide to rest up uh, for the night and during that night you had the return of the lovely tracers and so the tracers, they did, they did the same thing. They kind of bugged you guys for a minute, and then when you guys acknowledged them, they stopped and they went away. Pavic thought he'd be slick and uh, put a uh, glyph of warding on a rock and then kind of threw the rock out in hopes that they would come close enough and set off the glyph of warding. Sadly, the only thing that he got uh, in there was a squirrel. And at first I thought this was a little uh, mean of me because glyph of warding costs 200 gold to cast like 200 gold worth of components i forget what the components are exactly but i did clearly specify before he cast it that hey these things have stopped coming around for the uh, you know for the time being i mean i get where he's going and i you know i felt a little bad uh you know sucking up his money like that however i try to you know paint it out as these things they they have a they have kind of a set pattern and that pattern has now occurred, they came, they bothered you, you guys acknowledged them, they left. Uh, as you guys did head off in the desert, um, it didn't take long for you guys, once you got in the desert, um, you know, maybe an hour or two, you lost complete sight of that mountain range, which was really weird considering it was, you know, in your sight for a few days, and then all of a sudden you step in this desert, you're a couple hours into it, and you lose sight of the mountain range, and so you guys were going off of what you think is the right direction. Um, the desert travel, for the most part, was uneventful for you guys, leading up to the big event. Um, but uh, one thing's at night is an ego off in the distance would see uh, storm or uh, dust kickups, but the dust kickups were coming from the the ground. They weren't anything weather induced, so uh, they were always a bit far off. Um, 
you know, I describe the nights as being, you know, a nice starry night so you can see off in the distance, but you're not seeing everything clear. So, uh, and eventually you guys found out that those dust kickups, uh, you know, as I think is the third or fourth night into the desert trip, when you guys got surrounded by a group of 60 centaur and those centaur were closing in at first you guys were uh, by the time you realized what they were you first i think you thought it was a storm so you started to you know take cover uh and then as you guys realized that they're centaur you i don't think you really try to do a whole much but except for like stay in that cover and kind of get in a, a you know defensive position however those Defensive position didn't really make a difference because of the sheer numbers of the centaur. There was a 60 plus of them, and they tried speaking to you first in their language. You guys didn't understand, so they wound up breaking down to a common elven. And with that, they said, You guys can either come with us peacefully as slaves, because we're going to turn you into slaves, or you guys can try to fight, and then we'll knock the crap out of you, and you guys can then be slaves, but now just with less teeth. Uh, that didn't sit well with you guys, and so Ivar, Rondi, and Pavic decided they're going to try to make a stand. And when that happened, they just got blasted down with uh, all sorts of arrows. And uh, so the arrows kind of weakened them up, softened them up, and then the other uh, other uh, centaurs went in with their halberds and glaives and just finished them off, um, took them down to non-lethal damage. They just knocked them unconscious. And then from there, when all that was going on, uh, Thessalon and Inigo, via Inigo's instant plan, decided we're hightailing it out of here with Dimension Door. So he grabbed uh, Thessalon by a shoulder, cast Dimension Door, poofed away, you know, with the 200, 500 feet. I forget what the exact says, uh, but leaving Broomy there. Um, so... With that said, the centaurs didn't decide to bother chasing uh, Thessalon and Nigo. They figured they either teleported far enough away that they're not going to be of any uh, use, or they're just going to end up dying in the desert, and who cares? They'll find they'll either find them or the people who are dying in the desert. It's not a big deal. So with that, uh, Pavic, Ivar, and Rondi, along with Brumi, were taken captive. And once the centaurs started heading away, uh, a safe bit, um, Thessalon and Nigo went and checked out the remainder of, uh, you know, what remained of the wagon. The wagon was still intact, but everything was ransacked. Anything like your water and that kind of stuff was all taken. Your food was all taken. Um, and then Bridges was still there, uh, completely fine, unmolested, nothing like that. No, no damage to Bridges. And so you guys decide, let's go ahead and start pursuing the centaur, but at a safe distance. Um, that worked out well for the most part, but as time, you know, you guys, it's not hard to follow a trail of 60 riding horses, even in the desert. You know, you guys were keeping a uh, far enough space in between you guys, you didn't have to worry about getting caught. And eventually through like the heat of the day and not having water, you guys passed out. Uh, in the back of the cart, and britches just kept on going. And the next thing you know, you're waking up to the sound of britches lapping up water. You take a look, and you're at this beautiful oasis. You guys rush down, you rehydrate, and then as you're looking around, you see off in the distance there is a camp. And heading towards you guys is a single centaur, and he's carrying like uh, you know the the water over the shoulder type posts there. Although I'd assume it's all over his horse back. I don't you know who knows how centaurs carry water, right? Uh, so he's heading towards you guys, and with that, you guys are like, all right, we need to think fast. And so uh, Inigo went and started hiding the wagon, and Birch and then uh, hiding the wagon, and then Thessalon climbed up on Britches and kind of wrapped himself around Britches' neck and cast a size self to make himself look like a centaur. And I know if you if you're not part of this game uh, and you're thinking, why the hell did that work? It worked because the rule of cool, right? Uh, anytime something seems cool, you're just going to roll with it in sake of fun. And, you know, it was just a spur-of-the-moment wacky idea, and I decided to roll with it. And it, it played a big part in the um, session. So so he looked like a centaur, and before Inigo, like, went off to his permanent hiding spot, he ran back up. He touched uh, Thessalon with tongues. That way he could speak with the centaur in its natural language and went and hit off. Uh, from there, uh, Thessalon and the centaur went ahead and they started talking, you know, 
just kind of bullshitting about what's going on. And Thessalon was like, hey, I'm from this other centaur tribe, and I need to talk to your guys' uh, commander. I have a proposition from my tribe to your tribe. And it took a little bit of negotiation there, a little bit of charming, but uh, in the end, the guy agreed to allow Thessalon into the camp and take him to the commander as long as he helps bring back water. Uh, meanwhile, back at the camp, Pavic, uh, Rondi, and Ivar, they woke up. They're in these uh, prisoner uh, cages. Each one's in a separate cage by themselves. Their hands are bound in the, these big metal mittens, and they're gagged. Uh, Brumi is within sight, but she is uh, not gagged, not bound, nothing like that. You guys try to break free a little bit, try to struggle against the bars, but uh, this is not the Centaur's first slave-capturing rodeo, so it was really of little use for you guys. Um, going back to the... I might, I might do a little bit of bouncing back and forth because that's how we played the session. Uh, I essentially had two different stories going and then we intermingled them uh, later on. So you might hear me bouncing back and forth. So I'm trying to do it as close as I can in chronological order. So uh, Heading back into with Deslin there, he heads uh, to the commander's tent and says, You know what? Um, here's what's going on. I have... Uh, I'm representing another tribe, and we we heard about ransom of a princess. And if he th believes that you had the princess, and he describes Broomie, and he says, you know, uh, they'll pay very handsomely to have her back, as opposed to this being sold into slavery. But they also just, you know, need all her guards with her. Uh, and it took a bit for the commander to buy it, but eventually you guys did sell that, and the commander was willing to. Uh, to make the trade, um, and from that, you guys like hurry. Uh, I should you guys. Thessalon hurried back. Plus, he is worried about th tongue tongues wearing out, so he hurried back to Anigo at the Oasis, and that's where they devised their evil plan. And they said, you know what? Uh, they started writing to uh, Alderman Th Thistleting. It's like, dude, we are in some trouble. There is a massive camp of centaurs. They have half our party. We need something big. And knowing that Alderman is kind of an explosion type dude, like, do you have any sort of bomb that you can send us that preferably looks like some sort of treasure? Uh, Alderman thinks for a little bit, sends them back a note and says, yeah, I'll send it in pieces via the pneumatic tube that they have to send things to Alderman. And so um, so they start, uh, Alderman starts sending them things and through some, uh, a good intelligence check with Inigo, he assembles those things really correctly. The main thing though is Alderman's not known for specifics. So he says the timer's either someplace between five and 15 minutes. That's about the best he can give you. Um, and it wasn't any sort of ticking thing. I described it as being like this kind of golden uh, Ark of the Covenant type looking thing with two little plungers that you press on the side and it mixes some liquids in the inside which become unstable and grow and expand and then eventually cause the explosion. Uh, so having the bomb assembled, they descend, then uh, went back into the um, centaur camp and this time Inigo did with, go with them as a kind of looking as like a Bedouin type person representing the people that were uh, buying the princess back or uh, you know paying the ransom I should say. And in the meantime, I, I should say that uh, the commander did go and try to talk about, hey, well, I know you're a princess. Broomy was like, I have no idea what you're talking about because she doesn't know she's a princess. Uh, and you guys were all, you know, shaking your head no. And um, Broomy caught a butt of a glaive to her, which that really pissed all you guys off. And you guys all like mentally marked that commander must die. Uh, but back to the discussions with the commander in Thessalon and Inigo now. Uh, there was a little bit of role play there involving where the um, commander didn't want to speak in a language that Thessalon, or not uh, Thessalon, that uh, Inigo understood. However, since Thessalon no longer had tongues on him and Inigo now had it on himself instead, uh, there was, uh, you know, trying to find an excuse of why the centaur would need the other person to listen in uh, on the conversation. So eventually you guys did break that down as well, and I forget the exact reasoning how we came up with it, but uh, you guys got there, and the commander was like, hey, she's not really a princess, you guys are tricking me, 
And that's when Thessalon busted out the good old mindfuck and started talking to uh, talking to the centaur commander via telepathy, is disguised with a girl voice in his head, and saying that it was the uh, the queen of the Bedouin people and looking for the princess and described everybody and that really helped sell it. And so uh, the commander said, "You know what? That's fine. We'll take the deal, but uh, some of my people have to be there for the exchange. You guys left." As you activated, left the uh, the bomb there. Uh, while all that was going on, though, back at the uh, cells, one of the zippy tracer things came down and stopped and center of all you guys and looked at Broomy and her Broomy and this thing locked eyes. Uh, and I will say that this thing was like. Uh, it's essentially like a 20 foot long python type thing with wings and arms. Uh, its arms weren't very long though, like probably like human length arms on a python type, uh, like, you know, 20 foot long snake type deal. Uh, eventually, uh, it broke the contact with the eyes with Broomy and it broke uh, Broomy's cage door, just ripped it off completely. Broomy stepped out, and this thing was like trying to motion to Broomy to come on. She didn't want to leave you guys, and so she looked to the other people, uh, and this thing kind of looked a little perturbed, uh, but eventually broke everybody's locks, and then it took off. Once everybody, uh, oh no, first it broke the locks, and then it got you guys out of the um, the stone steel mitten things. So it got you out of that, and then it took off. Uh, from there, you guys started searching all the tents in the nearby area for a way or for gear. So the first tent you found, you uh, wound up getting a long sword and a uh, longbow. It was there was a centaur in there. However, the centaur was sleeping, and Rondi decided to not uh, attempt any sort of dangerous tactics there. He just slipped in, grabbed the items, and slipped out. Uh, the other tent, the second tent he checked, there wasn't anything really much of value. The third tent was uh, a centaur on guard, guarding over a um, a chest. And so you guys did a marvelous uh, sneak round, you know, stealth checks for everybody. It's not that hard when not everybody's not wearing armor. And uh, with that, you guys wound up taking out the centaur in one round. And as is about to die and start screaming, Pavic was... A little upset that he didn't get a turn because Rondi got an awesome sneak attack damage on it. And then um, Ivar did some good damage on it as well using some smites. Uh, Pavic ring came in and clapped the guy on the mouth so he didn't start screaming. And then just wrestled to the ground and did find your gear. So you started gearing up. Uh, and at that moment, as you guys are gearing up, uh, Thessalon and Inigo are approaching the center area where you guys' cells were. And the guard sees, the guard that will escort you there sees that, hey, the prisoners have escaped. He's starting to go run and yell that the prisoners have escaped. And that's when Thessalon, or not Thessalon, uh, Inigo broke in with Suggest and said, you know what? You just need to go home and relax. Uh, we'll talk about this in the morning. And so the guy uh, was kind of mesmerized, suggested, and went off and did all that. And so uh, from there, you're like, Shit, you know, what do we do? We're, you know, we're supposed to leave with a... Uh, bodyguard type deal and that's no longer going to be available because these prisoners escaped and that's when you heard these guys in the other tent. Uh, you guys headed in there and said, hey, you know, we got to pretend you're prisoners again. Take off all that gear that you just got on. Um, we're going to go ahead and get out of here. Uh, you guys gathered up, you know, put them in their shackles. You gathered all their gear and headed out uh, with your escort. And so the escort was two... Um, Two centaurs and then two things underneath the ground or underneath the sand. And you guys headed off towards the oasis. And as you're at the oasis or nearing the oasis, you start to feel the ground rumble. You turn back and you look and there's this giant void, uh, like purple explosion type deal, uh, expanding out from the camp and it encompasses the whole entire camp. And it grows really large and then all of a sudden it just sucks in really quick. And then where the centaur camp was is now a beautiful forest glade. Uh, meta, meta game knowledge, I did tell them uh, that this is, none of the centaurs were actually dead. All of them uh, just, 
replace that section of the shadow fell with something from the material plane. He's not sure where that something came from, and he's not sure where the, the camp was going to. Exacts are not his science. So, uh, with that, the, the centaurs were really confused what the hell happened. That was a beautiful time for you guys to start uh, kicking their sh uh, shit out of them. You did, uh, and those guys dropped pretty quick. Uh, the two things underground were belays, though. One of them, when the two centaurs went down, just started sh heading off the other way. Um, not want to deal with whatever's going on. One staying to hang out, and uh, we'll, that's where we ended. Was with one boule left, one heading out. Um, one of the other things I did that I thought was kind of fun was introducing Rondi because Rondi was not in the Shadowfell at the time. Um, he was a member of Aldevin's airship crew. Is Rondi came through the uh, the pneumatic tube as kind of like a capsule. They tossed the caps on the water on the ground. They didn't know what it was. All of them just sent a note and said, "Just add water." And so they added water, and then uh, Ronnie came out from this, uh, you know, this pill grew and grew, capsule grew and grew, and he started like ripping out like a membrane type deal. Uh, and just it doesn't. I'm not describing it as well as I am here as I did there, but I thought it was a pretty interesting character introduction there. As far as how this session went, it didn't go anywhere where I was expecting it to. I, I thought it was going to be uh, you guys understood you were being overwhelmed. And I, I don't like forcing the story like that, but I was trying to put you guys in an uncomfortable situation. And instead, you guys split the party and we created two different storylines. So the, my whole thing was that I was planning a kind of escape scene. And so then it became uh, an escape scene with the rescue. But then the escape kind of became not necessary thanks to the the good story and mechanics and whatnot that Anigo and Thessalon came up with. So this uh, this whole cam or this whole session was really thematic, a lot of role play. The combat that was there was all pretty smartly done. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed it. I think it was a really different cam uh, session and I think everybody had a lot of fun with it. So Normally, I'm not a big fan of splitting the party, but in this case, I think it worked out to be one of the more memorable sessions, uh, not only of this campaign, but probably of my DMing uh, career, whatever you want to call it. I went way over time, but there was a lot to talk about with the bomb and whatnot, so I apologize that this is a much longer recap. I will see you guys on Wednesday. Bye.